All right, good. Uh, thanks, Art, and thanks, I guess, FinTech Australia for um, hosting us uh, today. Um, I wanted to talk about, I guess, ASX's DLT solutions as a service. Um, I'm joined with uh, two of our customers being uh, Matt Mills from Boulevard and, and David Beros uh, from Digital X with his Drawbridge product. So um, Matt, I might just pass to you quickly to do a quick intro, uh, then David, then uh, Natalie, and then we'll get stuck into it. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Dave. And thank you, Paul, for that brief introduction. Um, and absolutely, thank you to FinTech Australia for having us here today to talk about how we're using the distributed ledger technology as a service platform provided by the ASX at Boulevard. Uh, we're very excited to be bringing that solution to our registry platform. Our target is very much around the unlisted security space, whether it's shares, options, notes, and we're keen to explain further in this today's webinar how we're using the DLT as a service platform to really revolutionize not only how unlisted securities are managed, but also the potential for the exchange of value between share holders in that space. So thank you, Paul, for hosting and Matt for facilitating today. David, mute. David Beros, uh, Chief <laughs> Product Officer at Digital X. <laughs> Always one. Uh, yeah, thanks again for FinTech Australia and ASX for hosting. Uh, Digital X is a public listed, publicly listed company and uh, one of the first blockchain technology focused companies to be listed on a major stock exchange worldwide. Uh, so at the moment, I'm leading the development of our drawbridge application, which uh, has a vision to digitize the standards required for listed companies to achieve great governance outcomes. Uh, being a listed company ourselves, we can see the challenges in that space firsthand, uh, but also the benefits and solutions on the horizon uh, through the changing technology landscape like projects like the chest replacement and the ASX's DLT system. Um, so we released Drawbridge, uh, which is an app that helps listed companies manage their securities dealing policy, uh, which basically lays out the rules around when insiders in a company can or can't trade. Um, so yeah, great to be here and looking forward to the conversation. And I guess importantly too, that both I guess Boulevard and Digital X are um, both members of FinTech Australia as well. Proud members. Absolutely, and very, very, as supportive and of the great work FinTech Australia does. So it's a real, a real honor to be here today speaking to the members of FinTech Australia. Great. And uh, Nat, you'll be, uh, you'll be asking the questions to us uh, a bit later on after the presentation. So maybe just a little quick intro from you. Also on mute, Nat. It's always one, isn't there? No, Hi, had, now, 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 now we've had two. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Nat McGarvey. I am Business Development Manager for DLT Solutions at ASX. I work with Paul very closely and um, I'm going to be the moderator today. So um, thank, you, thank you everyone for your time. Great, thanks Nat. Um, I will just look to share my screen and get the presentation up. I might just look for one of you guys just to nod that you can see. Not yet, Paul. Okay. Is that it says that you're started to screen share, but we can't see anything just yet. Okay. Hope there we go. The can see okay. now. Perfect. All right. Great. Um, so thanks everybody. Um, my name is Paul Stonham. I am the general manager of DLT Solutions here at ASX and Next five minutes or so, I'll give you an update on what uh, the DLT Solutions team is up to uh, in regards to our DLT as a service. Um, I'm going to try and sort of cover it reasonably quickly in about sort of five minutes or so. Um, so again, it may be sort of too technical for some or not technical enough for others. Um, but again, I'm happy to take um, further discussions and follow up uh, following this meeting. And I think Art's going to and FinTech Australia are going to publish our contact details uh, potentially in the chat um, as we're going on. So let's start with what we're calling, I guess, our main product, which is DLT as a service, uh, which is really a combination of, I guess, platform as a service, software as, as a service, infrastructure as a service. Um, this product encompasses the, the ledger, the nodes, the network and connectivity, um, what we're calling common services, all presented 
synthetically in a single single ecosystem, and we'll also have a cloud and on-prem um, hybrid platform too. Um, some of our customers today are obviously um, yeah, David and Matt, um, plus we've got universities um, on the platform, the other fintechs, um, all the way to the largest sort of financial institutions in the world. Uh, at the core of it, the ledger is the VMware blockchain ledger, um, which again, from my perspective, is you know, from, from, from how we're using is predominantly, I think, you know, the next generation of data pay, database technology uh, that allows the sharing of information, obviously, but with rights and privileges allocated to users via what we are using the DAML smart contracting language, um, which is provided by our partner digital asset, um, which is obviously basically the coding language um, that the applications are written in and then used to talk to the ledger and talk to each other in. Um, within that sort of broader ledger box there, we can have multiple individual ledgers and they'll all be interoperable and seamlessly connected to the customers. Um, at that middleware layer, we've sort of got what we've called common libraries and interfaces. And these are things or services that customers sort of need that may make the development and ongoing operations of their apps easier, but they don't really need to be built by every single customer. And, and a good like an analogy from that is, I guess, a GPS uh, in a mobile phone. There's only one GPS, but lots of apps make use of that. Every app doesn't need to write and support their own GPS. And this sort of stitches all the networks together. Um, in terms of the application, I guess everybody knows that ASX is replacing its current chess system with the chess register, um, which involves sort of you know, our clearing and settlement and issuer service activities. Um, obviously, uh, you know, chess is a highly transactional, high security requirements, high SLAs and uptimes that, that needs to be supported by the platform. And the platform will be able to meet all those requirements. So again, we should sort of give our customers a good sense that this is a highly trusted, trusted and, and enterprise grade service. Now, what is really, uh, I guess, important about what we're doing and sort of what you know Matt and, and David are taking advantage of. We're opening the, opening the platform up for others to come in and write applications and host applications on many different use cases. So they can be adjacent to Chess or they can, they can be totally new things. So um, we've obviously got uh, you know, David's drawbridge application sort of sits into that sort of company secretarial and corporate governance spot there with in terms of sort of listed companies adhering to the listing rules and things like that and, and the, the automation of the employee share dealing and director onboarding and all those that paperwork that uh, is currently the bane of a company secretary's existence um, you know we've got Matt and the Boulevard team looking at their private equity register as well um, which will again open up to their end investors and their list their, their companies listed privately with them as well um, ASX is also working closely with Gross Super for a superannuation member register um, and a couple of months ago in July, New South Wales state government appointed KPMG um, to build what they've called the business of building assurance solution, which is a construction industry transformation project in relation to how apartment buildings in New South Wales are made. So that's a very interesting, interesting use case. And, and we, you can Google that or I can put some links up onto the FinTech Australia website um, following that. And we're obviously doing a lot of other things in regards to sort of carbon um, energy track and trace and things like that. Um, I guess what you can sort of see in the green there really, and it's plus anything else. And, and I mean, the, the platform's going to really be able to put to support a lot of different sort of things, all the way from, I guess, the, the, the heavily regulated financial services, all the way up to sort of you know, NFTs, digital collectibles, um, and those sort of things. Um, and obviously, provided that it's legal, of course. Now, um, I guess one thing, well, I guess what all these applications have in common, which is essentially powered by um, the quality and the grade of the platform is they're doing things and offering services to their customers and potentially each other that are you know, improving workflows, reducing risks, you know, increasing compliance, eliminating paper and those sort of things. So I think obviously in some of these use cases that people are looking at or, or some of the, some people in the audience might be looking at today, uh, again, you can start off small and build from there. And obviously David and, David and Matt will sort of talk about their journeys as well. So I guess that is sort of DLT as a service sort of time box into a five minute uh, slot there. But like I sort of said, if anybody's interested in following up in more detail with, with uh, Nat, myself and the team here at ASX, um, our contact details will be available um, via FinTech Australia. So Natalie, over to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, so, I suppose a question to ask you is, what would you say are the main benefits of the ASX ecosystem? 
Um, I guess if I use, if I, even if I use sort of Boulevard and, and, and Digital X um, as an example, um, one of the biggest benefits obviously is a single customer being able to access multiple apps at the sort of same time, but also then the collaboration and the innovation that can happen between application providers. Because I'd imagine, you know, some of Matt's customers that may be private at the moment may have aspirations to, to list and they might sort of say to Matt at some point in time, Matt, we want to start, you know, implementing a bit more corporate governance. And we've seen this drawbridge application about director onboarding and employee scheduling. And so again, Matt and David could talk to each other and maybe collaborate and obviously potentially embed you know, David's product in Matt's service or, and vice versa and those sort of things. So to me, the ecosystem is really about empowering the constituents within the ecosystem to collaborate and innovate together, but then also, I guess, reducing that total cost of ownership um, about having to, you know, build the ledger yourself, support the ledger yourself, operate the ledger yourself and face off with all those sort of customers. So, um, you know, the customers that we have, and obviously the ASX has quite a big ecosystem of customers today with all of our different parties that talk to us across our various businesses, whether that's in equities, listed companies, AustroClear, uh, trading, derivatives, et cetera, et cetera. So there's quite a good audience of people in our ecosystem today, which again, customers can make, application providers can make use of in terms of that sort of single point of connectivity. And obviously also the ASX runs the network and connectivity too, which again can be another potential headache and another potential cost, um, especially when you're trying to scale up an application idea. So you're making it much easier for organisations? Easier, I think probably more cost effective and probably faster to market. But um, yeah, hopefully uh, that, 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 that my point of view might, might be backed up by Matt and David or, or, or may not be. <laughs> so um, over, thank you, Paul. Over to you, um, David. So what, what was appealing for um, Digital X to join DLT as a service? Yeah, I think just to echo Paul's comments, I'm really interested. It's early days at the moment, but just to see those network effects that will be achieved through interoperability between different applications. Um, Paul gave a great example between you know, potential between Drawbridge and Boulevard. Um, I think the other benefits, um, having been an organisation that have done it ourselves initially, uh, where we built a prototype or an MVP, um, and then yeah, looking to use the ASX's DLT as a service, I think it really just lets you focus on your core business, which is building software applications uh, rather than upgrading and maintaining uh, a ledger for yourself. Um, so there's definitely time-saving benefits there. But I also think most importantly for DigitalX strategically, um, really the customer credibility that you get uh, saying that you're using that ASX's DLT and really inviting customers to become and to come and join you on the journey of being at the forefront of those changes within their industry and where technology is going to lead. Being an early adopter. Yeah. And what about you, Matt? What what did you guys find um, interesting about joining DLT as a service at Boulevard? Thanks, Nat, and thank you, Paul. And I'm going to not try and echo entirely David's uh, statements because otherwise you're just going to hear the same thing. But it's for a lot of the same reasons we see the benefits of uh, using DLT as a service and work at the ASX. Primarily um, on our journey, before we were called Boulevard, we were called MyStake and we built a registry on the Ethereum blockchain. And whilst Ethereum is the de facto kind of blockchain standard in the public blockchain cryptocurrency space, it has a lot of limitations and also isn't fit for purpose in a lot of ways for essentially private information that you need permissions and controls and rules around. So what we got out of using and working with the ASX DLT as a service platform was number one, it meant that uh, we could essentially scale up a solution similar to what David and Drawbridge were doing uh, without needing to essentially manage and run our own nodes and our own uh, kind of uh, structures and maintain that. Um, but also we really like DAML as a language, we really like the benefits from a smart contract perspective, our goals around essentially automating and programming in rules around ESOP for unlisted companies, around governance protocols, around share transactions and trades. Uh, Demo lends itself up to well, really well, um, but also the nature of our business, which is focusing on private equities. Um, the word private is in there. We have to be mindful of that. And 
DAML lets us essentially control the permissions and rights. Um, but with the ASX DLT as a service, we can then plug in the data that's on the registries and on these companies and these securities to a wider ecosystem as well. So if a company wishes to take advantage of uh, for example, Drawbridge, uh, it simply needs to give permission for Drawbridge to access the data that Boulevard pushes to that uh, common data layer, which is fantastic. Um, so that's pri the primary reason why, but also there's benefits too in terms of, as David mentioned, credibility. Um, we know that the focus, energy and work that the ASX is doing has given a lot of confidence to a lot of companies in adopting this distributed ledger technology, uh, technology which is a new world really. Um, and I think also strategically, the fact of the matter is the ultimate goal for a number of our customers is to list on the ASX and to become a, uh, to become a publicly listed company. And so the advantage to us to be able to support that company through their entire journey from inception through to IPO is something that you know, we haven't seen done by really anyone else in a structured, uh, efficient manner. And that's something we really want to bring to market. That's why we chose to uh, utilize the platform was what made it appealing. And I think Matt, you sort of touched on a good, a good thing there. I guess with the DAML smart contracting language too, in the fact that also, um, you know, both of you may have, I guess, international aspirations to get to, to, to sell your applications in other jurisdiction. I suppose one good thing with, I guess, the DAML protocol now is the fact that it does work on multiple different ledgers and multiple different database technologies too. So if you were selling it to someone in Singapore and then needed to, they needed it to be in Singapore from a sovereignty perspective, and they wanted to use a different database or ledger underneath, um, then the DAML stays the same, right? Absolutely. Allow me to sing the praises of DAML for a hot second. Um, we love DAML because it's, of its flexibility. It makes it easy to write smart contracts that reflect financial contracts, which is huge. Um, but the way it plugs in, not just to say the ASX DLT as a service platform, but it's a hyperledger Ethereum gives us a lot of flexibility too, meaning that we can build an entire application ecosystem using it without having to worry about hitting, say, a technology dead end, which is always a concern because as you rightly mentioned, Paul, the needs and requirements in Australia uh, could be very different to Singapore or to the United Kingdom, two markets we're very interested in. And so using DAML means we have confidence that, okay, whatever the situation is in those jurisdictions, we can just plug and play. And that's fantastic. Um, or even, you know, if, if it's so maybe we wanted to plug into a public blockchain like Ethereum, that's still doable as well. And we've seen examples of other companies um, do the same thing like Civic Ledger. So we're very inspired by what they're doing. And so it's something that um, gives us a lot of confidence in why we chose to use DAML, but also why we chose to um, plug into the DLT as a service here in Australia. I think as well with DAML, um, it's quite unique architecture wise because privacy is at the heart. And I think, you know, if you combine that with the, the interoperability with the other DLT platforms and traditional databases, it's quickly becoming the smart language of choice. So back to you, Paul. So you've given us a bit of a broad spectrum as to some different use case examples, but as we are talking to the FinTech community, can you give some more examples of organizations that you're talking to within this space? Yep, sure. So I guess there's a lot of, lot of things, I mean, you know, DLT is very, very good at, at workflows and modeling workflows and value chains and process. So, yeah, so we're sort of talking to a few in the agricultural industry, um, <clears throat> whether that's sort of, you know, in the, the meat and livestock area or more in the grains and, and sort of sugar areas as well. Uh, transport and logistics, uh, obviously. Um, carbon and, and, and energy and ESG is obviously quite big as well there. As well. So, again, I mean, and we can sort of share some of these things too. Um, with fintech australia post this but again i mean digital asset has a lot of information and almost sort of have, have written some code libraries on a lot of um different types of use cases on their github page too so that's all that's a good source of i guess inspiration but also um it's all a bit of a cheat sheet too right because you've actually got lines of demo code in there that you can copy and paste and get a bit of a head start um <clears throat> if, if if you're sort of looking to sort of develop applications but sort of like i sort of said you know we're sort of talking to um, and getting inquiries with, you know, NFTs, digital collectibles, you know, all sorts of things. And, you know, the, the platform by design, you know, can support all of that sort of stuff. And we're also looking as well as what, what can we embed in that middle common interface layer that's going to make people's lives easier. So we're looking at, you know, data rights networks where you can move protected data, 
um, between applications or between users and time bomb them and encrypt them and, and all that sort of stuff too. So uh, having sort of you know, many conversations at the moment and um, uh, you know, gearing up really to, to support uh, you know, the, the, the two customers on, on the call here, plus another one uh, you know, to, go, to go live on the platform in the next couple of months. Exciting. So over to you now, David. So what would you say is your overall DLT strategy? Yeah, I think uh, like's already been mentioned, uh, DAML being a higher level smart contracting language, it can be run on a variety of DLTs. So historically at DigitalX, we've been blockchain agnostic is the term that we've used in terms of just looking at what is the best fit blockchain for requirements. Uh, and that's worked quite well from a strategic point of view. Uh, but I really see this as almost like a Trojan horse where not by disguise, but through the chess replacement, Australia's largest listed companies and a decent chunk of the economy is going to effectively be onboarded onto a DLT platform. And I think that's really, really exciting. Uh, the way I see that evolving has similarities to what's been happening in open banking. So where consumers are now empowered with their own transaction information to be able to share that with who they wish. I think listed companies will be able to, for instance, selectively share uh, their stock registry and the holder information around their shares with different applications that can give them cost savings, uh, risk mitigation benefits, and a whole heap of, of other things. Uh, and that's just on the financial markets, um, securities kind of side of things. I think because it is uh, a generalized DLT layer, um, seeing the potential to then link up that data with completely different data sets, whether it's uh, ESG reporting, uh, carbon offsets. Uh, I think the other use case that Paul mentioned uh, with the New South Wales government and KPMG is looking at the provenance of building materials through a supply chain. Uh, so I think it's really, really exciting just to see the amount of different types of data that will be interoperable and plug in. And so in terms of our DLT strategy, it's really to be a part of that ecosystem. So having taken a, a blockchain agnostic view, uh, we're now at this point where we can see really tangible benefits to accelerate customer acquisition and onboarding, uh, given that our customers for Drawbridge are ASX listed or company secretaries and CFOs of ASX listed companies. So, yeah. Thank you. And Matt, over to you. What is your sort of overall DLT strategy? I'm going to bounce off a point that David mentioned, which was if we, if we look ahead and we think about the benefits of what the ASX is doing and the chess replacement and all the financial markets coming in. For us, it's about plugging in a part of the market that previously hasn't really been plugged in before. We, we know the unlisted space has been quite separate um, and quite uh, uh, independent from the listed space, which means that the data just hasn't been there. The visibility hasn't been there. Um, and it's been primarily dominated by uh, high net worth, sophisticated investors, but that's changing through movements such as equity crowdfunding. A lot more individuals are getting into these private companies, whether it be because of the growth in the startup space in Australia or the growth in equity crowdfunded companies, or even just um, through their super funds and so forth, entering this, this space as well and through their investments. So I think for us, the DLT strategy enables us to do really two things. Number one is essentially be a provider of data uh, to a wider market that previously didn't have access to it. And when we look at providing uh, these other financial market participants, whether it be um, in terms of portfolios, brokers, uh, or even the chess replacement itself, um, the, the opportunity becomes then, number one, can you list more seamlessly? Can you do that process more easily? Does that make it more available to companies to essentially list on the stock exchange? But number two, on the flip side, um, it lets us then use the information we have to enable greater liquidity for our own companies as well. We think that's bringing across some of the visibility benefits from other platforms that are using the same DLT means that we can give greater confidence to other participants to start investing in the private space. And that really, for us, hopefully will mean greater 
capital availability for companies to really start doing some cool things. Our journey has always been about helping companies grow and uh, raise money and be able to take advantage of the growth in the private space. And so we see our DLT, the DLT side as solving that transparency and enabling that liquidity piece to then allow for the interoperability between different groups to participate in the private space. And I think Dave, uh, David's what they're doing, what David's doing is with Drawbridge as a great example, as Paul alluded to, because it means as companies uh, look to list, they don't have to think about these things. They can just go, well, as soon as if we're on Boulevard, if we list, then we immediately have access to Drawbridge. So there's our governance problem solved, for example. Um, or alternatively, if you're a B Corp and you have solutions in the ESG provenance space, you can start pulling that information and providing that to your investors as well and showing not only that you're performing well financially, but you're performing well from a sustainability triple bottom line perspective as well. So ultimately it's all about the data and access to data and visibility of data. And that's for us, our core DLT strategy. Cool, thanks so much, Matt. So um, back to you, Paul. So we've talked a little bit about um, the ledger agnostic um, part and also about DAML being interoperable. How important is that and the interconnectedness with the ecosystem members overall? Look, I, I think that they're obviously really good characteristics, but I think even more importantly than that is the, is the seamlessness of being able to do that. So if you sort of, if, 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 if the DLT, if, if, if our you know, service didn't exist, for example, and, and Matt and Boulevard sort of went sort of the Ethereum vertical stack and, you know, David may have gone a, a Hyperledger quarter sort of stack and then, you know, in, a, in the next year when, when one of one of Matt's companies was about to list and they sort of said, I want to use that app, then, you know, David's stuff might be in a, in, a, in a data center in Perth and Matt's might be in a data center in Sydney. And then they've got to try and work out how they're going to connect their two things and what protocols, what APIs and all that sort of stuff. But again, when you're on the same platform, using the same smart content technology, even if it, even if it ends up sort of, you know, Drawbridge is writing to a separate ledger than, than, than Boulevard, those ledgers are interoperable, right? And also the networkness is that the networks will be connected with the underlying sort of mesh network that, that ASX will be using to connect, you know, David's node to the platform and Matt's node to the platform. So again, all Matt would have to do is, you know, add David as a party to his, to his application and permission him to see whichever of his clients data that his clients wanted him to do. And then, you know, Matt and David's already connected. David, I mean, David doesn't have to lift a finger, really. He's already connected to the platform. Matt just needs to give him the credentials and away they go. So you're sort of talking 24 to 48 hours of being able to really start doing business together. Um, but if you get in disparaged systems, in disparaged data centers, very expensive, you know, time delays, a lot harder to collaborate and a lot harder to innovate. So I think, you know, interoperability, tick, interconnectedness, tick. But I think, you know, the value is, how seamlessly can you get that sort of stuff done? And I guess happy for happy for Matt or David to sort of uh, co comment on that point of view of, of mine as well. I'm just going to uh, very much agree with what Paul's saying. I think the problem with the current way things are done is everyone's data is on their own databases. And so if I, one of our customers, for example, they wanted, or even one of the users of our platform, say a shareholder, they're using something like uh, NetWealth to access the full kind of portfolio of their investments. Uh, right now, the solution is we'd have to build an API to NetWealth to enable our users to be able to do that. And that's complex, time expensive. We have to make the judgment call if we want to do that work. Um, and it's really, you know, not as good an experience as it could be. Whereas by plugging into this wider ecosystem, we don't have to make those decisions. We don't have to get in the way of uh, how our users want to use their data and how they want to see their data as well. And I think that's really powerful too, because it means that suddenly by being on the same data layer, all you need to do as a company or as an investor or as a uh, participant is simply say, well, I want to use uh, Drawbridge all I need to do is give permission for Drawbridge to access my data and suddenly I'm able to use Drawbridge stuff. There's been no, no requirement for me to speak to David and say, hey, David, can I, can I have API access to your system? No, 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 no. It's, it's all kind of in the mix already. And I think that's, that's, that's really powerful because it puts power back into the hands of the users. And I think for us, that's always been something that's been, been important to us, which is you're letting uh, kind of these companies and these users take advantage of a wider system using the data that they've created and uh, entered through Boulevard. David, any comments? Yeah, and I'll just, yeah, I'll just jump in and um, give an example. So for the Drawbridge application, 
um, when we talk about data, the actual data that we store on the ledger is trading approvals of insiders within a company. So it includes if it's a buy or sell, like really simply number of shares, who approved it, what time the approval was given. So it really creates a digital audit trail of insider trading requests. That's the data that we have on the ledger. Uh, but I guess one of our objectives is to really close the loop around insider trading risks. So we would love uh, in the not too distant future to match up the actual trade that was made on the basis of a trading approval so that we can inbuild compliance into that process. Um, so when we talk about yeah, being able to uh, have data interoperability and matching up certain things, I think I just wanted to give that example to show um, yeah, just to try and make it real and, and illustrate the point. Yep. And um, David and Matt, what would you say is sort of the biggest challenges you've faced on this DLT journey? Yeah, uh, so for us, the idea for Drawbridge came out of an internal innovation program. Uh, the genesis really being we spoke to over uh, 30 company secretaries just in terms of the day-to-day -day problems that they see around corporate governance, what, what sucks in that job, uh, what they enjoy. Uh, and we began to have this pattern around insider trading risks and status quo process being handwritten forms that are often just scanned and, and stored in an email inbox in a lot of cases. So we, we went ahead and built an MVP or, or a beta uh, and also use that as a learning opportunity to get our developers familiar with DAML. Um, so I'm eventually getting to, to what the challenge was. Uh, in terms of that prototype, we put every single piece of data on the DAML ledger uh, because it was as much a learning exercise as it was to solve a real problem for this customer segment. Uh, but that was, I guess, the most extreme way of uh, showing the challenge that we encountered, which is upgrading smart contracts uh, and data models. So immutability is a real benefit, but when you're looking to pivot a business model or iterate on what you're doing, uh, it's very difficult to change something that is by its nature immutable. Uh, so I think tips around that is to just keep it very simple. Um, start small, uh, have your data model such that the data that you're storing on the ledger is unlikely to change because in, rather than upgrading smart contracts, you really have to redeploy a new one and then migrate your data over, which can be tricky and time consuming. And Matt. It's, it's really interesting hearing David say that just because I think every company that builds on a blockchain runs the exact same issue where you try and do it, use the blockchain and distribute a ledger for everything. You kind of go, actually, that's maybe not the best usage of it. And I think, you know, the, the primary challenge for us has been uh, knowing exactly and being very clear as to where DLT brings benefits and where it doesn't bring benefits. Um, and in, in our space in particular, there's a lot of documentation, uh, communications, uh, materials, which are always changing. Uh, a good example is, for example, um, options. You don't want, say, an options agreement on the DLT because that needs to be cancelable, that needs to be amenable. Um, you may want the results, so you know the outcome of those ESOPs to go on the DLT, but you don't want that itself on, on the ledger. Um, and I think also... Yeah, the challenge is that it's still a very new nascent technology. The best thing about using the ASX DLT as a service is we haven't had to think about implementing or building the technology. We just think about how to use it. Um, but at the same time, you have to bring your customers on the journey too. You have to make them comfortable with it. Um, not every company necessarily wants, even though you know, they're not, the information is not going out there, it's not publicly accessible. Um, the whole point of using demo is that it's all permissioned and private so that only those you give access to can access that data. It's still a big leap in terms of uh, that thinking and thought process. And so, you know, you're going from a place where you have to trust, say, Boulevard with your data to a place where you have to trust not just Boulevard, but the wider ecosystem that everything's set up properly, that you're not going to have any data leaks or anything along those lines too. So I think to summarize, the biggest challenges have been 
like David also mentioned, being selective in terms of what you put out there, but also communicating the benefits and communicating why you're choosing this particular technology over and above others um, to your users and to your customers as well. And something that we're slowly building up to, we're not uh, necessarily right now, for example, pushing very much to the DLT, for example, we're working up towards that because we want to bring uh, our customers on the journey as well and introduce the benefits in a way which benefits them as, as customers, as opposed to just forcing the conversation. Thanks for sharing, Matt. So there's a couple of questions that have come into the chat. So the first one is, will we, will we be able to share the presentation slides to all attendees? And the answer is yes, we will do that. Um, and the second question is from somebody at the University of Sydney. And the question is, I would be interested to learn what the panelists see as the main cultural barriers to scaling DLT as a service and what needs to change across the industry beyond the technology. So I'll start with you, Paul. Um, I guess I might just defer to either David or, or Matt first, because I guess they're probably more talk. It's really sort of, I guess, you know, and, and Matt touched on it a little bit too. It's sort of what conversations are they having with their current end users, potential end users? So I might sort of defer the, the, the initial question to those guys and I might sort of chime in at the end. Hmm. Uh, I think my initial reflections there, uh, culturally, I think there's still a lot of scepticism around blockchain generally. Um, given like its origins and a lot of the media attention that it gets that can be negative. So I think having a conversation with customers where you can disassociate that and talk about the, the benefits um, in a trusted regulated environment is still really important. Um, it's changing rapidly though. So I'm very optimistic about that. Uh, and secondly, I think another conflation issue um, the chess, thinking that the chess replacement system is one and the same as the DLT ledger layer, uh, when in fact, as Paul's diagram at the start of this session illustrated, uh, really the way to think about that is that the chess replacement is the first application on the DLT system, uh, and that's going to be opened up to third parties and, and other people to build a whole ecosystem of other applications. Uh, but I think just getting that point across and communicating that uh, is still really important, particularly for people that may not have heard about the system before or uh, aren't from like an ASX or listed company uh, type of background. Absolutely, David, nail on the head with terms of that conflation between chess replacement and ASX DLT as a service. And I often find myself in conversations going, you know, one's coming much sooner than the other. Um, and by the way, we're in a, we're a private equities register. We, we don't actually have very much to do with the chess replacement in, in terms of first pass benefits from using that DLT as a service component too. So I think for us, we'd be very, we're very excited to kind of raise up that discussion in terms of showing people the benefits of the ASX DLT um, completely independent of the chess replacement as well. Of course, there will be links to it, but I think that's one of the cool things opportunities Boulevard has is to help people along that journey of going, you can use the ASX DLT as a service um, without necessarily having to wait around or even there's no need to wait around for the chess replacement. Um, the other point of the education piece is, is I think one that also touches on data and data sharing and data privacy. Um, there's very much a, a need to help people become comfortable and, and the idea of sharing data, some fantastic areas in terms of open banking, uh, consumer data rights um, that's coming through. Um, and I think this idea, the, the, the conversation is very rapidly shifting to this idea of people have the right to control how they use their own data. And so one thing that I think is to be mindful of is helping people feel comfortable with the idea that even though we're on a distributed ledger, even though that information would be accessible, the benefit of using DAML and the ASX DLT as a service in the wider ecosystem is none of that data is accessible unless you give permission to do so, um, which is, of course, a huge contrast to the more well-known public blockchains where everything is visible and traceable, which are, which are their strengths, and that's what they exist to do. But... Um, it's about separating that conversation, helping people feel comfortable with the idea that um, the reason why this exists is because there's a recognition of the importance of ownership and control over the flow of data, um, which is something that we 
we see as a core benefit of using DAML and the DLT as a service. Yeah, and I think that that's sort of important as well. I guess it's sort of some of the confusion too that you sort of pointed out between chess and DLT, but there's also confusion as to what's an open blockchain technology versus what is a private permissioned blockchain technology. And sort of, again, when something goes wrong, who's taking responsibility for it? And obviously, I guess, as, as anyone in the audience who's been following it closely, uh, the Senator Bragg FinTech Inquiry 2, which has just sort of come, come out recently with their 168 pages of recommendations, particularly sort of in the, the digital asset or cryptocurrency space. So I think, again, you know, I think regulation is going to help um, and things like that. And sort of that'll sort of lift, lift things up too, because it's like today, if I'm a sort of a, an individual investor and I don't know too much about it, it's just like, well, what if I make a mistake? Who do, who do I ring up if something goes wrong? And obviously that's different depending on whether you've got a, a private permission ledger versus a, a, an open, fully, fully open decentralized system as well. Yeah, and I think something else notable to share is um, ASX's chess application is the largest, or at the moment, it's the largest DLT application in the world. One of, and one of, I think. That one of, to be, one to, of to sorry, be, be. one of, one of the largest DLT. And <clears throat> ASX was the first exchange globally to move their chess or the equivalent of chess to DLT. Um, and it all sort of um, came together when the VMware blockchain um, had developed their blockchain so that it became enterprise um, enterprise grade, um, which is why ASX decided to use it for the chess modernization project. So lastly, does anyone have any further comments? We're now sort of 45 minutes into the presentation. Um, does anyone else have any final comments to make for the audience? Uh, I'll just touch on you go, man. Uh, I'll just touch on the point you made there, Natalie. Um, it's been great talking about ecosystem benefits in terms of uh, Australia and the domestic economy. But as you alluded to, the potential for DAML to be rolled out to major securities exchanges globally, um, and the ASX being the first, I think gives us as Australians like a, a really good competitive advantage in terms of being first to market globally uh, and able to export applications as DAMLs progressively rolled out among securities exchanges. I think that's super exciting. And yeah, the comment I'd like to close on. <laughs> Matt, any final comments? Thanks, Nass. Um, look, I think there's something that uh, Rebecca uh, said recently to one of her letters to the FinTech Australia community. And I really, um, resonated with me, which is the idea that in Australia, fintech is really become its own industry. We're very much the world leaders in developing new solutions, new uh, uh, products, new platforms that can really harness that nexus between finance and technology, whether it's open banking, consumer data rights, um, or, or in our case, registry. And uh, something that I would love to leave with the community here uh, to think about is the see change that what the ASX is doing by having the confidence to roll out their biggest application and one of the biggest DLT based applications shows the way in terms of the potential and importance of this distributed ledger uh, technology, but also the ecosystem it can bring and something I hope uh, we can do as Boulevard is, I guess, provide an example of how by plugging into that system, you can really bring transformational fintech solutions to, to market. And so we're very excited to be on this journey. And we're very excited uh, to be working with both Paul and the team at the ASX, as well as alongside others like David at Drawbridge and Digital X. Um, and we really would love if anyone in the member audience would love to learn more about our journey or want to, uh, you know, they, they have an idea and they want to see its applicability, be very happy to kind of help you in that thinking process too, because we think that this is not only just something that could really transform how the finance industry is it interacts in Australia, but could really show the way globally how DLT can really bring benefits to to wider the fin wider financial ecosystem. Cool. Yeah, and, I, and, and I suppose sort of Matt and, and David, I mean, you you for both of your companies were one of the one of the first to, I guess, log on to our log on and start to use our sand pit to sort of familiarize yourselves and and start to code apps. Uh, with Daml and obviously the, the sand pits available to everybody so we can again we can put a link 
um, in for people to sign up on that. But I guess you thought you, I think you thought you just might have just had your final words then. But again, what advice would you give to sort of other fintechs sort of you know, in your position, sort of, you know, 12, 18 months ago when you were first sort of starting out and, and logging in and starting to sort of see demo how it worked and all that sort of stuff? What, what advice would you sort of give them, um, I guess, just to sum up and, and, and finish up for today? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat what David said earlier, <laughs> and plug in what you just shouted out, Paul, which is, jump onto the sandbox, start with something small, have a go with it, and see how how it plays out within your particular application. Um, for us, it was very much a case of learning about the technology, uh, speaking to the team at ASX DLT Solutions, and really trying to see the potential of it through very small but interesting projects, which eventually built up to the full picture for us. Mm. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think uh, one of the great things is that everybody by and large that works in this space is passionate and want, wants to see that vision achieved. So jumping onto like the DAML community Slack channel, uh, if you do come into any issues, you can literally talk to like, the lead technical product manager for DAML um, directly, uh, which I think is super fantastic and something that you you don't always get the benefit of. Um, and I, I'll finish as well with a plug, but a helpful plug. Um, <laughs> we've just released uh, the ability to uh, create a free trial account for Drawbridge. So if you want to have uh, a bit of a go on what the look and feel is there, uh, go to opendrawbridge.io. Yeah. And Paul, anything final from yourself? Uh, no, just um, yeah, thanks, uh, Matt and David, your participation, and thank you for um, you know, being amongst the first customers that'll that'll I guess use the platform in anger in the next uh, couple of months, and we're looking forward to uh, to getting that happening uh, sooner rather than later. Thank you all. Thanks to everyone for joining. Um, I'll just give a quick sign up on behalf of FinTech Australia. Thanks. Um, to Paul from Paul and Nat from the ASX and uh, David from Digital X and Matt from Boulevard um, for the session today. And I hope um, everyone got a lot out of it. Um, we'll be uploading the recording on our channel afterwards for anyone that missed out on parts of it. Um, and also we can provide uh, contacts for anyone that wants to reach out with further questions. Great. Perfect. Thanks, Art. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks you all. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye.